because it's just right all the time. Just right. Uh, that sounds like uh, uh, the Outback Steakhouse. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're talking with Arthur C. Brooks, who's the president of the American Enterprise Institute and the author of the new book, The Battle, How the Fight Between Free Enterprise and Big Government Will Shape America's Future. Arthur, thanks for joining us. Hi, Nick. You open the book with a chapter about the 7030 nation. What, what is the 7030 nation? The 7030 nation is, uh, uh, is all about the contours and public opinion between uh, the people who like the free enterprise system culturally and the people who reject the free enterprise system culturally. So one of the things that you find is that most Americans don't see free enterprise as a, just an economic matter. They see it as kind of a lifestyle issue. They see it as the bedrock of American culture. And that's about 70% of the population. You go out there and you ask people, do you believe that the free markets are the best way to organize our economy despite severe ups and downs? Yeah. Seven in 10 say yes. About 20% say no, and 10% evidently don't understand the question. Who are, uh, who are the people who don't, the 30%? Who are, who are the people who don't like free enterprise? And what form, uh, or, and actually, let's take it back a step. Define free enterprise. Well, free enterprise is, the, I mean, it's, it's the manifestation of the freedoms that our founders talked about. So our, ta our founders talked about making the freest nation in the world, and how do you, you have to express that in some way. And the way that we express that in our workaday world is a system that you know, limits government, that uses free markets to allocate rewards and consequences of behavior and one that's not overly concerned with, with income distribution. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, favor leveling. And that's in stark contrast to European-style social democracy, which has a large and growing government, which believes in a managed economy and has as its principal aspect something that its big goal is making sure that people are more or less equal in how much they, uh, they take from the economy. At one point, you wrote the 30% coalition twists equality of opportunity into equality of outcomes. They elevate money to the level of justice by saying that this must be equal to, as Karl Marx famously put it, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs, or as President Obama put it almost as famously, when you spread the wealth around, it's good for everybody. Isn't that, I mean, from a persuasion, from a rhetorical perspective, isn't that inflammatory? Because it doesn't seem, I mean, who, who are you speaking to there, the 70%? or the 30% I'm something. speaking to the 70% that needs to stop losing arguments. Mm -hmm. That needs to stop losing arguments for what they understand is true fairness. Look, I mean, we've got, you ask who the 30% coalition is before, and I told you about the 5% that are in idea industries. There's another 25 percentage points in there, and 15 of those percentage points are young people who keep hearing fairness, 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 and they love it because fairness sounds really good. And the people on the political right, or the libertarians, the, the, the free market here, you and me, we get stuck talking about economic efficiency. So you know, they'll say, well, we want a fair system and we'll say, but don't you understand that'll cut a quarter percentage point off long-term economic growth rates and everybody just yawns because these guys aren't even paying taxes yet. We need to be making the moral argument and that means actually stopping losing the arguments about this basic concept of fairness that, that goes around all the time. Now, you said there's a fine line between what one person sees as economic equality or income equality and what other somebody else sees as opportunity equality. That's the fight I want to have. That's the argument I want to have. And if we, if, look, if everybody in America agrees to repudiate the idea of income equality right now, then, let's, then we'll have a deep fight about what opportunity equality really means. And, you know, I can take that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your uh, kind of personal ideology or intellectual journal. Uh, you were a professional musician for many years. Mm. Uh, you play the French horn. I did. And uh, uh, all over the place, right? Yeah, all over yeah, the world. Actually, uh, didn't make it quite through one year of college uh, when I was 18 um, by sort of mutual um, uh, uh, conclusion of the college and me. Uh, we went our separate ways and I joined a chamber music group and traveled around the United States, visited all 50 states playing chamber music, and I joined the Barcelona Symphony in Spain for several years. Who is your favorite musician? Uh, my favorite composer, and this is a hard thing to answer no, when you're a right, classical right, musician, yes, right? Yes. Because you've got the creators and you've got the recreators, right? right? So I go straight to the creators. My favorite composer is Anton Bruckner. And why is that? Anton Bruckner is, uh, he is the embodiment of what was best in the Romantic period, building on everything that had come before it. That said, um, if I have two minutes to kill, it will always be with Bach. And why Bach? Bach because it's just right all the time. Just right. Uh, that sounds like uh, uh, the Outback Steakhouse. I don't know. <laughs> well, I want to thank Arthur C. Brooks, uh, author of The Battle, How the Fight Between Free Enterprise and Big Government Will Shape America's Future. Also the president of the American Enterprise Institute for Talking to Reason TV today. Very much a thank lot of fun. Nick. Thank you. Thank you.